Welcome to Cyber GMBC. This month we celebrate our 59th anniversary with Dr. Tellis J. Chapman. We honor our father and father figures and our history with Juneteenth. And we conclude the month by celebrating Elijah Day with Dr. E.L. Branch and the celebration of our high school graduates. We continue our hybrid worship experiences on the first and third Sundays in GMBC and the second and fourth Sundays will be virtual. Our prayer is that the sermons will be inspirational as well as informational and transformational. We welcome you to our cyber GMBC worship experience. Shall we pray? Gracious God, we are thankful, we are grateful. Lord, we are thankful for 59 years for this wonderful church, Gethsemane Missionary Baptist Church here in Westland, Lord. We thank you for 59 years of ministry we thank you for 59 years of this church being a blessing to this community, O oh Lord. We thank you for the lives that have been touched in these 59 years, the souls that have been saved, those who have been baptized, those who have had their homegoing services through here, Lord, those who have been wedded, O oh Lord. We thank you for 59 years of GNBC in this church, Lord, in this community, O oh Lord, in this section of town. We say thank you, Lord. Lord, we ask now that we will continue to do your will, to do your work, Lord, that we will continue to be a vineyard for souls, O oh Lord, that we will continue to be a place where lives can be changed and transformed, O oh Lord, in your name. We thank you, Lord. We glorify you, Lord. We lift you up and we thank you right now. Lord, we ask for continued blessings upon our church family, Lord. Everyone who calls this church their home, Lord, everyone whose soul has been touched by this church, whose lives have intersected at this church, O oh Lord. We're praying right now, Lord, that you will bless us, O oh Lord, that we will be a strong church that will continue to lift up your name, Lord, that will continue to stand for justice, Lord, that will continue to pray for our enemies, O oh Lord, that we continue, Lord, to keep going on even when we feel like stopping, Lord. Lord, I'm asking now that you will bless each one, Lord, each person that's a part of this church family, from the youngest to the eldest, O oh Lord. Lord, we ask you to bless our brothers, Lord. We ask you to bless our sisters, Lord. We ask you to bless our parents, oh Lord. We ask you to bless our married couples, Lord. We ask you to bless our singles, oh Lord. We ask you to bless our widows and widowers, oh Lord. Lord God, in your name, Lord, we ask you to bless the single parents, Lord, the single mothers, the single fathers, oh Lord, that are doing the best they can, Lord. Allow this church to be able to reach every segment, every demographic, oh Lord that we encounter, Lord, that we'll be a blessing to them, O oh Lord, and that their lives can be changed and transformed by being a part of this wonderful church, Lord. Lord, now we're asking as we're gathered at this altar, Lord, that if there are any needs that need to be met, O oh Lord, that you meet them, O oh Lord, any circumstances, situations, Lord, that you handle them, O oh Lord. Lord, we're praying right now, Lord, for those who have medical challenges and medical procedures they must encounter, Lord. We're praying for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, O oh Lord. We're praying for those who are navigating through this virus, O oh Lord. Lord, we're praying for jobs, Lord. We're praying, Lord, for those that are in school for protection, O oh Lord. Lord, we're just asking you to be with us, to keep us, to lead and to guide us, Lord. We love you. We praise you and we honor you, Lord. We ask you to bless the preaching of your gospel, O oh Lord. We ask you to bless the hearing of your gospel, but ultimately, Lord, the implementation of your gospel, Lord, into our life, into our lifestyles, O oh Lord, that your word would not come back void, that it would touch hearts, minds, and souls, that someone may come asking, what must I do? to be saved. Lord, we pray these and all other blessings. We pray for our governments, O oh Lord. We pray for those that are in charge, O oh Lord. We ask you to touch the hearts of those who are stony and evil and hatred, O oh Lord. We ask you to touch and bless their hearts and touch and bless their minds. We're trusting and we're depending on you. Lord, we ask you to bless us throughout this day. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen.
Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to give. Lord, you've been good to us. Lord, you gave first. And Lord, you've asked us to give a portion of what we have to trust you with the rest. And so, Lord, we ask that you become Lord of our finances, that you teach us how to trust you with our finances, oh Lord. And Lord, to prove, allow you to prove to us that you're trustworthy. We thank you now, oh Lord. For those who will participate in the giving of tithes and offerings, those that will trust you with their finances, O oh Lord, those that will trust you and depend on you to help them handle what's left over. Lord, we want to do right by you. So, Lord, I'm asking you to bless everyone who will give. Touch those who will not. This is our prayer. We pray that what is given will be a blessing to the furtherance of your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Even when he is old, 
He will not depart from it. We hope to see your child at GMBC's Youth Sunday School each second and fourth Saturday from 10 until 10.30 a.m. on Zoom. It is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce and present our guest preacher. As GNBC celebrates our 59th church anniversary, our guest preacher is one who I have admired from afar for many years until I became pastor and was formally introduced to him. He is described as one of our premier preachers and pastors of our generation. I have known him to be a walking thesaurus and wordsmith. However, I have also discovered that he is provocative and prophetic as a drum major for justice, who's relevant for all ages. He is unapologetically Christian and unashamedly African American. Let's welcome the proud pastor of the Galilee Missionary Baptist Church of Detroit, Michigan, the Reverend Dr. Tellus J. Chapman. Honorable Pastor Dr. Duckworth and to this awesome church family, Gethsemane family, and to those of you who will attend this moment of worship and celebration via social media, my brothers and sisters, how sweet it is to be a child of God and to have this privilege to share on his agenda. Uh, certainly it warrants I praise as we participate uh, in the Lord's work. Thank you, Pastor Duckworth, for your humbling and honorable invitation to come and share with you and the wonderful workers and worshipers, leadership and laity of the Gethsemane Baptist Church family as you celebrate another year of ministry in the name of the Lord. What an awesome opportunity it is. I want to call your attention to the third chapter of the book of Acts, beginning with the first verse through to the 10th verse. And once you shall have found that passage and read it there, you may see these words. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, which reads as follows. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at the three o'clock, at three o'clock in the afternoon. And a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the beautiful gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him and as did John and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. I want to share with you today and issue this challenge to this great preacher and pastor and church and tell you to render ministry. Take it to the next level. Ministry on the next level. Ministry 
on the next level. The greatest thing you will ever do is what you do for God. There is no greater task, no nobler undertaking, no endeavor that is more sanctified than that that you will do for God. The world as warped and thwarted as it is would not stand the chance for productivity if it were not for the people who do what they do and when they do what they do, they do it for God. I think it is essential or it is necessary, it is imperative that I share with you a disclaimer at this moment and remind you that God, if he so desires, can be an independent worker. God does not need the help of human hands to render ministry for heaven. God is never in dire straits, God is never in need for anthropological assistance to render ministry in his name or to get done what he wants done in his name. God made the sun, the moon, the stars, and weather without the help of human hands. God scooped out the oceans and shaped the shaggy head mountains and leaned over the balances of heaven and kissed and capped them with snow and left humanity and observers in awe without the help of human hands. God put the planets in their celestial positions and he enabled the incandescent spheres that we call stars bespangled against the black bosom of an ebony sky and makes them twinkle like white diamonds on black velvet without the help of human hands. God puts pigment in a rainbow and hangs it around the shoulders of a dying storm without the help of human hands. God has never been, is never, and will never be in need for the help of human hands. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, it is an awesome honor and precious and priceless privilege to render ministry in the name of the Lord. But not ministry that is trenched in tradition. Not a ministry that is harnessed by habit or cradled to custom, but a ministry designed to take people to a whole new level. Enough of this stagnation. Enough with the status quo. Enough with being in a trench that leaves people forever in a state of redundance, doing the same thing over and over and over again. It is prime time that we render ministry in the name of the Lord with the same message but implementing different means and measures by which that ministry can be effected. If you want to really see a quintessential case, an excellent example, and a perfect paradigm, go back to the text that we just read together and that I've read in your hearing. It is that that concerns the incident of Peter and John, perhaps two of the most notable immediate followers or disciples of Jesus Christ who would be identified among Christendom as apostles who while on their way to the temple in Jerusalem encountered a paralytic uh, at one of the entrances of the temple or to the temple, namely the gate called Beautiful. Unfortunately, the name of the gate did not concur and coincide with the nature and condition of the man they encountered. In that this man lay at the gate called Beautiful, but he was in an ugly circumstance. He was a paralytic. This is not to demean or belittle or disparage those who have a disability that prevents them uh, from their individual and independent mobility. 
The objective of Luke in this instance is to further convey not just the history of the church, but how to hurt, how the church was to help those with a hurting history. They encountered this man who was a paralytic, shared with him the, the healing propensities and powers of Jesus Christ, raised him from a dead level, put him on the square, and enabled him to live a life that was upright because they were to exhibit and exemplify the rendering of ministry on a whole new level. My brothers and sisters, if this church... And for that matter, if the congregants of Christ would at all be effective, we need to assess and evaluate how we have been doing ministry and question ourselves as to whether it is really effective or does it need modifying. If we continue doing what we've always done, we will always get what we've always gotten. And in order to get where we've never been, we've got to start heading in a direction that we've never headed towards before. We must look in places we've never looked before. We must begin reaching for things we've never reached for before. If ever we would come out of this mode of mediocrity, and uh, this continuing construct that leave congregants where they are, we must reassess what we are doing that we may implement a mode and modus operandi that takes people to a whole nother level. I think there are some things, some helpful holy hints that hails from this text which will become for us some suggestive scenarios as of what we could possibly employ that the world may witness life in the Lord on a whole nother level. I believe that it calls for camaraderie with consecrated companions. It was the great motivational speaker Les Brown who said on one occasion, sometimes what's wrong with you is not what's wrong with you, is who's wrong with you. And it's because we have acquaintances that forever keeps us in a state of subtraction rather than addition, negativity rather than positivity. It keeps us in a state of stagnation rather than progression. The text opens by saying Peter and John were together on their way up to the temple at the hour of prayer. My brothers and sisters, this Luke the author casts a light upon uh, the differences in the identity of Peter and John and subliminally infers the varying characteristics of Peter and John but did not stop until he impressed upon the reader and the observer that they were still together. My brothers and sisters, this Peter and John team were post-Pentecostal Peter and John in partnership because pre-Pentecost Peter was a life-carrying, quick-tongued, temperamental, hot-tempered, kind of Peter, the kind that would reach for a knife and go for your throat but only catch your ear. This kind of preacher was so hot-headed and high-headed, he had the egregious gall guts and chitlins to rebuttal the statements of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This was post-Pentecost John and post-Pentecost Peter pre-Pentecost, John was timid and tacit and touchy and reclusive and retiring. But in this instance, Peter and John, having been consecrated, they have companionship now that enables them to be one with the other. My brothers and sisters, this is essential because eventually that companionship will eventuate 
into enemy territory. You got to remember now, this is still, they are still in Jerusalem. The place that hated Jesus, the place that crucified Jesus, the place that hung Jesus, the place that killed Jesus, the place that didn't want Jesus, the place that was no friend of grace, the place that was not accepting of a new movement of foot that was a threat to the Roman Empire, not for political reasons, but because it was a threat to the power base that engaged and introduced a religion that would turn not only Jerusalem around, but Jerusalem and Judea and the uttermost parts of the world. This area, this era, this time, this ambiance in which we live, this mundane domain that we call world, this sordid, sinful, spoiled, soil, and sinfully, satanically saturated society in which we live is no different than ancient Jerusalem. It is necessary that we have consecrated companionship because you don't have consecration on the Supreme Court. You don't have consecration in a color-coded house of Congress that can shift from party politics and play pigment politics to make sure that people with too much pigmentation won't get any further than they already have. It is necessary that we have consecrated companionship because you won't get it on a Supreme Court and in a power base that can forever speak and boast about freedom and pay billions of dollars for a social media outlet in the name of free speech and then turn right around and tell a woman what she can't do and decide to do with her own body. This is enemy territory. Those who plot and plan to kidnap and kill governors because of a political position that will keep a whole world safe. My brothers and sisters, it is necessary to walk with, talk with, hold hands with, and get in lock and step with somebody who's headed in the same direction and somebody who desires to do the same thing in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise his holy name in that if we will affect the world and take the world to a whole new level, it will take companionship with consecrated company. Praise his holy name. There is an ultimate companion uh, who uh, is always with us. My brothers and sisters, he walks with us. He, he talks with us and, and he tells us that we are his own. If the world, if the world would be taken to a whole new level... Uh, uh, it will require a, a power that can permeate problems and lift people. Yeah, yeah. We have um, heard the expression power in so many varying contexts. We've heard of white power and black power, green power, solar power, steam power, horse power, wind power, love power, all of these powers carry their own individual influence. White power is a dangerous kind of power. White power will surf the shores of Africa and put people in chains and drift them across the Atlantic and dock drop them off in the new world, put them in chains and make them work for 246 years and never give them a paycheck. White power will separate federal government from state government, my brothers and sisters, and engage in a Jim Crow apartheid system of government and make one people get to the back of the bus and off the bus if other people got on the bus. This kind of power would put up a sign that says white only, black only. This kind 
kind of sign which will ever perpetuate the wealth gap between people of color and those who have very little color. I'm afraid of white power, but just as afraid of black power because black power will ascend to power and forget the power that put it in power. Black power will sit on a Supreme Court with a black face and a black robe with a brown gavel and an Oreo filling underneath. I am afraid of black power. Black power won't reach back and help other black get into power. My brothers and sisters, we've heard of all kinds of power, but there was another power present and evident in this text. It wasn't black power. It wasn't white power. It wasn't love power, green power, solar power, wind power. It was all power. That's the power that put perfume in a flower, put a shirt and a skirt in a ball of cotton, put diamonds in, a, in the heart of the earth put glass in a grain of sand gave height to a giraffe speed to a cheetah mash to a gorilla wet in water sour in a lemon sweet in a melon it is that power that took nothing and made everything took the leftovers from dirt which is dust took dust make a man made a man took a man made a woman and took a man and a woman and made every man all power rock you to sleep last night watched over you all night long and then touched you this morning with a finger of love and beaded your golden moments to roll on a little while longer we need all power yeah. that power penetrates problems and lips people and everybody has problems it does not matter where you sit what you have how popular you are everybody has problems problems are a part of every king's palace problems are in every queen's quarters problems are on every commuter's interstate problems are in every pilot's cockpit problems are on every sailor's ship in every teacher's classroom problems are in the courthouse white house your house, schoolhouse, my house, and yes, sometimes in the church house. But even though we have problems, there's a power that can permeate our problems and lift people. Peter and John were on their way to the temple at the hour of prayer, but even though they were on their way to pray, they encountered a problem. My brothers and sisters, in the event that we will encounter problems, it's best to run into problems with prayer than to not pray and run into problems. They ran into problems as they, a problem rather, as they encountered this man who lay at the gate called Beautiful. Luke described he could not walk. He was paralyzed. You know, medical science would contend that uh, his spinal construct and muscular system did not concur with the motor command of his brain, which left him a paralytic. Luke's emphasis, I believe, in this instance was not to describe or feature a person who was physically unable to walk or whose physiological circumstance was precluded by the inability to walk but to really prove what paralysis really is because there are some people who are paralyzed and don't know it. They got a mind and other people tell them how to think with it. They have money, other people tell them what to spend. They have a house, pay for the house, the mortgage and the rent and other people tell them how to live. They have their own individual lives and other people tell them how to live it. My brothers and sisters, that's called paralysis. Everybody who can't put one foot in front of the other is not necessarily paralyzed. Some of the greatest people on the planet have affected the world from a wheelchair and from a sick bed. And there are those who are walking around every day. They have independent mobility, but they're paralyzed mentally, paralyzed educationally, paralyzed emotionally, paralyzed. My brothers and sisters, yet there is a power that can penetrate our problems and is designed to live people. When they met this paralytic, uh, he asked for money. And Peter responded, we don't have what you want, but we do have what you need. We don't have money, but we've got the master. 
We don't have coins, but we've got Christ. We don't have dollars, but we've been around the divine. And he has deposited something within us to affect your life that it will raise you from where you are that you may be where you need to be. My brothers and sisters, this society needs to encounter this power that can permeate any kind of problem and lift people because there are pundits in society who would rather see people down and out and perpetually in the pitiful, petulant places that they already are. They see women work the same job as men, but would dare have women receive the same kind of pay. They see people caress their craniums within the corridors of some astute college somewhere and come away with qualified credentials, but are no sooner than they enter into the workforce, they are judged not by the content of their character, not the qualifications of academia, but by the color of their skin. We, my brothers and sisters, are in need of a power that can penetrate our problems and lift people to a level of where they need to be. We need a power that can penetrate committees in our nation's capital that can observe a significant amount of melanin in the skin of a qualified candidate for the Supreme Court who is in fact more qualified than any candidate in the history of the Supreme Court. Hear all the credentials, brag about the credentials, but turn right around and refuse to endorse her just because of the color of their skin. We've got problems. We've got problems, but I'm not worried. I know about a power that can penetrate any problem and is designed to live people. They said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. We, you know there is power in that name. Let me raise a few questions of you, and I know it's perhaps a bit personal, but I'm going to ask them anyway. Do you have any rivers that seem to be uncrossable? Do you have any mountains that you just can't tunnel through? Let me share with you about a certain kind of power. My God! specializes in things that are impossible and he can do what no other power love power can't do it money power can't do it black power can't do it white power can't do it green power can't do it solar power wind power demonic power angelic power and no other earthly power can do it but all power can do it Oh, praise his holy name. Let me see if I can just press uh, one more bit of emphasis here that uh, we may be reminded that uh, we can render ministry on a whole new level, that the world may be raised from where it is. My brothers and sisters, it's going to take some adequate evidence of the divine anointing. They said to him, in the name of Jesus, Rise and walk. Luke says, the brother got up. There is much uh, misconstrued, uh, misappropriated, and misapplied, and misinterpreted uh, genre and verbiage on what anointing really is. People get talent and uh, physiological gifts uh, confused. Uh, with the anointing. My brothers and sisters, the anointing is not really evidence by a person who can launch lovely, laudable, lord-like lyrics through their lips and lungs and sing the songs of Zion. The devil can beat you singing Amazing Grace. He can rock with the rhythm of Zion songs and lean shoulder to shoulder by fellow choir members and praise teams in the choir law. But it does not mean that they are anointed. They may be experts and well-trained at counting money, but it does not mean they ought to have oversight over the money of people who give their tithe week after week and contribute their coins to Christ. My brothers and sisters, that does not mean that they are anointed. When you can take a stick that has been touched by the Spirit of God, stretch it out over sea and turn a sea into a sidewalk. That's anointing. 
My brothers and sisters, when you can take a piece of garment and strike a river and try and make a sidewalk in the middle of a river, that's anointing. When you can have yourself placed in the midst of a valley that's full of bones and just by preaching the word of God and speaking to the wind, a valley full of bones will get up, take on muscles and skin and stand up like a mighty army. That's anointing. When you can go in a den of hungry lions and make a den of hungry lions go on a crash diet, that's anointing. When you can be thrown into a fiery furnace and yet be fireproof for the flames of the fire while the fire burns up those who threw you in the fire, that's anointing. And when you can take a nail in both wrists and a knife in your side and a spike in your feet and die on a Friday but predict you'll get up three days later before you die on a Friday and on a Sunday after the Friday get up with all power in your hand that's anointing Clara Pollard is perhaps made famous for one line and that line is where's the beef as this small framed old lady put the windless food chain on the map with one line Where's the beef? And the objective of the question was to show up other franchises that had and offered and sold more bun than beef. And Clara Pollard said, uh, I'd rather have more beef than bun. In other words, if you really have what the consumer need, there ought to be some evidence. They said to this brother, get up in the name of Jesus. Don't have what you want, but what we do have, we're going to share it with you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Luke says he got up, stood up, and started leaping and praising God. Went into the temple with Peter and John leaping and praising God. Luke says, somebody asks, where is the evidence? All of the people saw him leaping and praising God and recognized that it was the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate begging for money but in this instance he was no longer begging he was a believer he was no longer collecting coins he had been converted he was no longer asking for money he had experienced the power of the almighty God and he began leaping and praising God because he had experience and was experiencing life on a whole new level. I bid you good day, but before I leave you, I need to remind you there ought to be some evidence that you have been anointed. When you can render ministry in the lives of people and they get up from where they are and uh, praise God for who he is uh, and for all that he's done uh, and affect those who are on looking. My brothers and my sisters, uh, the world will declare there is the beef. Oh, praise his name. Uh, if you really want to know uh, what it really looks like, uh, come with me uh, on the outside of Jerusalem uh, on a bad Friday. On that Friday, they killed a man named Jesus. Oh, praise his name. Uh, he was considered to have been an enemy of the state of Rome. But I tell you what happened. Uh, they crucified him on Bad Friday. But three days, three days later, what happened 
on Bad Friday. Read in the headlines, uh, Bad Friday. But on Sunday morning, on Easter Sunday morning, somebody said uh, we can no longer call it Bad Friday. He got up. Sunday morning, we've got to change the narrative. It's Good Friday. Oh, praise his name because he got up so you can get up. He got up so the world can get up. He got up so society could get up. He got up with all power in his hand. He walks with me. And he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and all oh, the joy oh yes all oh, the joy that we share as we tarry there none other has ever known bless your soul oh praise his name take it to another level, take it to another level, take it to another level, give God glory, give God glory, oh, 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 oh glory. If you were blessed by the worship experience and would like prayer to give your life to Jesus or to join our JBC family, please go to our Facebook page and inbox us or complete the new discipleship form on our website, jmbcwestland.org, or even call the church at 734-721-2557. Also, we thank all and encourage others to give if you are blessed by the worship experience. There are various ways to give your tithes and offer, bill pay, givelify, PayPal, and Zelle. You can also mail them to the church or drop them into our mail slot at 29066 Eaton, Westland, Michigan 48186. For this month, our special anniversary offering is $100. Please join us in this celebration. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and follow us on Instagram. We pray that what you just experienced was a blessing for and to you. We thank God for the last 59 years of the GMBC family and pray for our father and father figures as well as our graduates. Our continued prayer is for all of those whose lives have been touched by this pandemic. As the numbers are fluctuating, we want to still use caution and wisdom to protect ourselves and others in our lives. May God bless you and may God bless your heart.